And welcome to everybody again. And I am excited to see you have a few visitors here. Uh, actually, we got a little larger crowd than normal today. That's a good thing. That's that's another praise to put on the list of praises. Amen. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the goodness of God. And you know what? How many in here like pizza? Does anyone like pizza? I like pizza. We like, some of us, we like steaks. and Some of us, we like ice cream. I know someone that likes ice cream a lot. <laughs> For me, the goodness of God, you want to hear me talk about it a lot. Because the goodness of God to me is like eating pizza. It'd be to dad like eating ice cream. Amen. You don't eat it once and say, wow, that was good, and move on. You know? No, I, I usually I, I still sneak a pizza in every now and then. And I know dad, I catch him off and on with ice cream. I even got a few pictures to prove it. <laughs> but he didn't eat ice cream once and decide, you know what? That was really good and never have it again. So that's kind of the way I am with the goodness of God because I tell you what, I don't think we hear it enough. So many times we got the world to hammering us down on a regular basis. There's always plenty of negativity around us. And I'm sorry to say many religions like to take out their big God whooping stick and it has God on there, and they go to beating you with it, and you think, I had to put up with beating all week long from the world. Why would I come to church and get another beating? So if you're looking for a beating at church, you may have to look a little harder somewhere else. Now, I, I might step on a toe or two every now and then, but the majority of the time, I'm all about the goodness of God. We're going to start out in uh, Mark 4, 35 through 41. And the same day when even was come, he saith unto him, Let us pass over onto the other side. Now this is Jesus. They're getting ready to go across the sea to the other side. He'd been teaching all day long. There was a lot of people there. And there's a lot of lessons we can get from this. You know, sometimes, you know, people will see me up here and I'm up here preaching and and you know, every now and then, I got to kind of unplug from everybody. I got to recharge. And uh, whenever I see that Jesus needs to, that makes me feel a lot better. You know what? If the Son of God has to unplug every now and then, there's nothing wrong with me taking a break. <laughs> uh, and when they had sent away the multitude, they took Him even as, even as He was in the ship, and there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and saith unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. So today I'm wanting to talk about, in verse 38, And they said unto Jesus, Master, Carest thou not? Jesus cares. And it's interesting that we start out when Jesus says, let us pass to the other side. He already said where we're going. Many times we have direction in our life. We just don't follow that direction we were given. God gives us direction. He says, you're going to do pass to the other side. But then them storms show up, problems arise, and first thing we say, Jesus, don't you care? 
That to me is an odd question. The disciples have been with him. They've seen him perform miracles. They've seen people healed. They've heard messages he's preached. And then they question whether Jesus cares or not. We have the same thing goes on so many times in religion. Time they get that uh, God stick out and they beat you. And your world's done beat you down. You go to church, you get some more beaten. And you got to wonder, God, do you even care? We're going to cover some of that today. We're going to talk about the goodness of God. God does care. Let's go to Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Within many of these messages, there's going to be two main things to always remember. One, how do I think of God? How I think of God and what I think God is like is going to shape my life. It's going to give me direction. If I think God is going around punishing me on a regular basis, I'm going to live a fearful life. I mean, every day the world's beating you down, and now a God that we worship is beating us down too. That's not a good way to live. But when I understand that God loves me, wants the best for me, and He don't have any reason to punish me, you say, well, how can you say that? Well, when Jesus died for us on the cross, He took the punishment for every one of us for every sin we've ever committed. God punished Jesus for our sins. Why does He need to punish you now? He's already punished His Son. His Son has paid the price. There is no price for us to pay. I lost my temper the other day. God's going to strike me down. No. He struck His Son down for my sin. When I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I have accepted that He paid my cost. It is there for me to simply receive. So many times we don't just receive. He's paid the cost. God does not need to punish us. Well, you know, I had, I had liver issues for a while. You know, I, I could easily sit down and say, you know, I don't live a perfect life. Sometimes I do things I shouldn't have done. God surely must be punishing me. No. God punished His Son on the cross for all my sins. You are free. Jesus came to set us free. He did not come to punish us. He did not come to torture you somehow, to somehow teach you a lesson. That is not why Jesus came. He did not come to condemn. He came to save. We need to change how we see God and how we see ourselves. That is the renewing of your mind. You need to understand when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a child of God. People make it too complicated. I was thinking of it the other day. I help my kids out anytime I can. And they're grown. By world standards, they technically are not my responsibility at this point. They're adults. Go take care of yourself. No. I still help my children. Surprisingly enough, my children don't live their life the way I think they should live it. I mean, surely anyone's got kids can go going to relate. Well, you know, little Johnny, I, I wouldn't have done it that way. But I still love my child. And when he doesn't do things the way I think he should do, sometimes he gets in trouble. I'll help him out where I can. You know, I, I do what I can to help my children. 
Sometimes they don't manage their money quite right and they need a little bit of help. I still help them when I can help them. How much more does God do for us? If I, if my son doesn't do something quite right, I certainly, even if I had the power, I wouldn't go strike him down with cancer. Yep, son, you don't have a savings account. I think you should have had a savings account. Boom, you got cancer. That'll teach you. Hopefully, once you get over cancer, you'll learn your lesson. No. That is crazy talk, people. But people lay this at God's feet all the time. It just drives me insane when someone tells me that they're sick and God must be trying to teach them something. No. He sent His Son to teach us. We have His Word to teach us and we have the Holy Spirit to teach us. We do not need cancer. We don't need the flu. We don't need the colds. We don't need broken bones. God does not work that way. Proverbs 4.23 4, Start with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What does that mean? That means if you do not have a good healthy image of who you are through Christ, it's going to give you a lot of aggravations. If you think God's punishing you all the time, you're, you're ready for it all the time. You know, you're ready to be whipped. If you understand that God loves you and you understand that the devil's out there looking to kill, steal, and destroy, the devil wants to steal everything you got. That's what he does. He wants to destroy you. He wants to ruin your life. That's his job. God's job has always been his goodness. He draws us to him himself through his goodness. Uh, James 1.17 For some of you that's looking at this, this, this is coming from the Word. It's not coming from me. Every good gift. Every. That's all. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Variableness is if I'm going home and I go out here and go on Highway 15 and straight to my house. That's straight. Now, if I was, there was variableness in my travels, I might go one side of town and work my way up and come down the other and maybe catch a gravel road somewhere and come around the back. That's variableness. That's, there is no variableness among God, you know, with God. So many times they say, uh, nobody understands the mysteries of God. Well, it's because you're not reading the Word. God did, doesn't have a bunch of mysteries. He tells you who He is. He tells you what He will do for us. Let's go to Acts 10.38. Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with Him. Jesus had said in there, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Meaning that if we look at Jesus' life, look at what Jesus did, He didn't do anything outside of God's will. He didn't do anything that God did not ask or appoint Him to do. And here it says God appointed Jesus. To do what? To go about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. God is looking to do good through His Son even. God was with Him. They worked together. John 10.10 10. This is one we all ought to know by heart. I've noticed I've had this and highlighted many times. 
the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that's the devil. That's what he came for. He came to ruin your life. He came to make you miserable. He came to make you sick. He came to take all your finances. And if you want, you can say he even come to give you a blowout and a flat tire on your car. If it ain't good, it didn't come from God. Now, one of the verses that people confuse a lot of times, God can make good out of anything that happens to you. So if you wake up, you go out and you got a flat tire. I don't know. I don't believe that God give you a flat tire. But I'll bet you some good can come of it if you are living and believing that God only has the best for you. I am come, and this is Jesus speaking, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Jesus came to make our lives better. And when you look at Jesus coming to make our lives better, Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God came to make our lives better. God does not come down to make us miserable. Hebrews 6, 14 through 18. Saying, surely, blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he, en he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise, that's us, we are the heirs to the promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay upon hold upon the hope set before us. There is a doubling in, in verse 14. By blessing, I will bless thee. That's multiplying. That's times two. That you got your blessings and then you got the little two up there. That's times itself. Blessings upon blessings. Multiplying upon multiplying. God wants the best for us. He set out the best for us. Many times we don't have it because we don't receive it. It's out in front of us. Take a hold. Men swear by greater. That's many times you hear someone, they'll swear on, on the Bible or swear on her mother's grave, which would be kind of a bummer for me because mom's still here. <laughs> but God cannot lie. It's impossible for Him to lie. So one truth, God says, I will bless you. God says, I will multiply you. And then He doubled down on it and He gave an oath. And God, simply by His Word, that is truth. But for God to give an oath as well is truly an amazing thing. God has promised and given an oath saying He will bless us. And He said He will multiply us. And somehow or another, we, people will still talk about how He's going to beat us up. Yeah, I don't... When you take the time to read the Bible, you're not, you're not going to see anywhere in the New Testament that God's looking to beat you up. Exodus 34.6. Well, let's look at some of the Old Testament here. We'll get you bouncing all over the Bible. that keep you on your toes. So, Moses said a little setting here, had asked God that if he could see him, if he could see God. And it's been stated in here in different places that more than likely if we were to look right on God, look at God directly, we wouldn't even survive. I mean, it's just too much. So God 
passed by Abraham and said, or Moses, passed by Moses and allowed him to see his goodness. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. God, when he revealed himself to man, he revealed his goodness and His truth, and His long-suffering. But what about all these places in the Bible where He's wiped out entire civilizations and such? I've had it explained to me in a way that kind of makes sense. If you have a cancer, and you're dealing with it in a worldly sort of way, which most of us, we live here, that's the way we end up dealing with it, the doctor will go in, he'll cut that cancer out and he'll cut it out to keep it from spreading. If you read your Old Testament and you read it on a regular basis, you'll start to see something. It took me a long time to start to see it. God would say, you need to wipe out this group. But another time the Jews would ask God, do we need to wipe out this bunch? And he says, no, they have not reached the fullness of iniquity. They were bad. Don't get me wrong. But they still hadn't reached a point. They were so bad, they had to be removed or they would contaminate the rest of the human race. Ah, let's go to Psalms 27, 13. Sometimes we uh, endure trials of our own. We have sicknesses. We have things that wear us down. And David had as well. And this is David. He says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That means we don't have to die to experience God's love. You know, we can experience it today. As a Christian, if you're not a Christian, part of you will die in order to see God's goodness. You know, when you give your life to the Lord, that human nature, that spirit of the world would die, and then we'd have another spirit placed within us. But this is talking about physical living. David had so much on his plate, so much stress, so much going on, that he would have fainted unless he believed. And this is back to what I'm saying. We have to believe our vision of God's got to be a good vision. If we don't believe God's good, we're going to have problems. David, he believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That is, today we can see God's goodness. Jeremiah 29.11 For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. That's, that's towards you. That's, that's you. Saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God does not think evil towards us. He does not have any anger towards us. When He sees us, He sees His Son. We are accepted. We are beloved. And we are blessed. Jeremiah 31, 3-4 The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tab tabrets, and shall go forth in the dances of them that make merry. I didn't look up see what a tabret is. But, God loves us with an everlasting love. And how does He draw us to Him? With loving kindness. How should we react? We should go forth in the dances of them that make merry. We should be happy. 
we should be in a good mood. God's overcome the world. And He took that victory and gave it to us. We are more than conquerors. 2 Peter 1.4 Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have been given great and exceeding promises. How come I don't see them in my life? Well, you have to accept them. First, you need to know what they are. That's reading the Bible to figure out what are these promises. And then second, we've got to accept them. 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If you are not a Christian, if you have not accepted Christ into your life, these promises do not apply to you. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Uh, whosoever is born of God, that is you as a Christian, a Christian brother and sister. I do hope that all of you are my brothers and sisters in here. If you have accepted Christ, if He is your Lord and Savior, these promises apply to you. Hebrews 6.14 God promises blessings upon blessings. Life more abundantly. And it is ours. All you have to do is reach up and take it. One of the simplest analogies I've heard is a man holding a hundred dollar bill up says first person that comes up here and takes it it's yours and if you don't take it it's not yours you have to reach up and take it God has so many blessings for us he's not going to force them on us many times we're trying to figure out why why I have the troubles I have it's not because God hasn't offered, but I have to accept. And this is a tough one for me sometimes, is sometimes it's tough for me to understand who I am as a Christian. Many times it's hard for me to accept that I am worthy. I don't feel worthy sometimes, but I have to know and I have to believe that because God is worthy, Jesus, and I've accepted Him in my heart, because Jesus is worthy, He has made me worthy. As a brother and sister in Christ, everyone in here is worthy of these blessings. If we don't have them yet, it's because maybe we have a flawed image of God, and maybe we have a flawed image of ourself. And for me, it's the latter most of the time. I have a flawed image of myself. Many times when I'm up here, I feel... I project confidence and I project what's going on, but that's the, you know, in the Word, but that's the Holy Spirit working through me. The Danny that's at home, sometimes I don't feel like I measure up. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm enough. But I have to push them feelings aside and know. Sometimes we don't feel like it, but we have to know. It's a renewing of the mind. Know who you are. Know. Don't let feelings mess with you, because they will.